Oh, thanks, Tom. And it's it's really great to be here at the um, NDF. I've always kind of followed it from a periphery, but um, you've actually attended a conference. But I feel like there's been a lot of material that really relates to my work as an artist. Um, and so, yeah, as Tom said, I'm doing a PhD in fine arts at Massey University College of Creative Arts. Um, and although the booklet says that I'm here with the Aotearoa Digital Arts Network, which I am a member of, and they're absolutely fantastic. I'm officially here um, as a Massey University student. Um, so I'm a qualified artist. I uh, have a Bachelor of Fine Arts with honours. and. Um, have been making art that relates to the internet and internet culture and new technologies for about the last 10 years. Um, so I'll just quickly run through a few previous projects that have kind of led to this. So hopefully it kind of puts it in perspective of where I'm coming from. So this is one of the first projects I did um, in my graduate year of studying, which was a series of drawings of pencil and paper that kind of was seeking to represent some stories that I'd encountered online um, back in 2005 that kind of occupied this this um, territory of being believable or not believable, this kind of you know truth or fiction. And um, and I thought it was kind of quite interesting that there were all sorts of urban myths and legends coming onto the internet presented as fact and in a largely kind of unmediated environment. Of course, now we've got things like Wikipedia that are a bit more well peer peer reviewed and. Um, Reputable, but at the time, you know, there was a quite a strong um, anti-internet uh, resource uh, message coming from lecturers and uh, at the um, university I was studying at because there was a sense of distrust of what was online there. So I've got things up here like um, these drawings by a Japanese guy. Um, well, the the crystals by a Japanese guy who would stick these words on bottles of water and claim that they changed the chemical makeup of the water, depending on whether it was a positive message or a negative message. Um, the Humster down here, the Mars rover, and um, this is a time machine that was available for sale on Trade Me. Uh, <laughs> And then I moved, uh, that, that project kind of set off a few copyright questions for me that I kind of didn't really manage to answer as a student. And um, it led me into this series, which was um, in response to the fleet of icebergs that had drifted up from Antarctica to the coast of the South Island. And I cause was really interested in this, but due to financial concerns, couldn't travel down to see them at the time, even though Shrek got to visit them. Um, and so I set about to search images of the icebergs online from media resources, and then tried to recreate those in my flat with household objects in a sheet. And then um, took photos of those and digitally edited them and then printed those and then made drawings from those. And I kind of thought, oh, that's got to be enough kind of derivative process to avoid copyright infringement, right? So so I made this and um, I thought it went pretty well. But um, yeah, this is now in the Wellington City Council collection, which is quite cool. Um, and then it kind of turned into getting involved in the political debate about copyright. And I was one of two people who founded the Creative Freedom Foundation to represent New Zealand artists in the copyright debate here. Um, there was a particular law, section 92A, does anyone remember that, yeah, this thing? So um, yeah, we did that. And uh, and then I got into making 3D printing and using Creative Commons and kind of starting to give my work back to the internet community and start to release it and let go a bit. So um, yeah, I spoke a bit about this on Monday. There'll be some video of that online, so I won't talk too much. Um, did a um, made a proposal for a colony on Mars, Pioneer City, pioneer-city.com. It's still you can check it out. Um, and yeah, some more kind of 3D printing projects. And yeah, through the CFF stuff, people often assume that I was a lawyer, which is quite interesting. Um, I kind of certainly read a lot of law and sounded maybe like I knew what I was talking about. And, and people still ask, ask me for copyright advice, but I've kind of got to say, I got 99 problems, but a law degree ain't one, you know, I had passed the bar. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Jay-Z's uh, Black Album. Um, uh, but I did end up studying some copyright law through Harvard University, which is um, the Facebook post of mine that's got the most likes when I said that I got into Harvard. <laughs> um, so that was completely, completely online, free, but really amazing content through edX, which is a, a MOOC, a massive open online course um, that I studied when I was at home on maternity leave with a two-month-old, which is slightly ridiculous. Um, but really, really great content. And they're actually offering this course again um, next year. They're taking applications right now. So if you're interested in copyright and reading and engaging with a community 
community online it's really well structured you can have weekly tutorial video meetings with your tutorial group um, so I found that really quite useful in terms of understanding things a bit more and then this is a kind of another part of my life which is you know crazy trying to <laughs> trying to be a serious artist with um, that kind of thing going on. Um, and so, te kia um, So this is, yeah, part of this project, this, this PhD, which I started in June, July, middle of this year. Um, so I'm quite early on, but it started with this rather kind of comprehensive project to restore a mural that's connected to the Southern Cross Cable. And um, so I'm just going to talk about how it kind of came about because it's quite a crazy story. So um, early last year I was invited by Letting Space, who are a Wellington-based public art commissioning group, independent group, um, who are really interested in projects that are socially engaged and engaging communities and kind of um, operating outside of institutional kind of t traditional um, models and uh, we'd actually done the Pioneer City project together put on a real estate showroom for this property on Mars in downtown Wellington and an empty um, retail store um, earlier and they asked me to um, put a proposal forward for a project with JWT, John Walter Thompson, who are an um, international advertising firm with an office in downtown Auckland. Um, so JWT had approached Lending Space and said, we've got this, this glass cabinet that's you know one wall of our boardroom. Um, it looks through to the offices. We're interested in having some interesting art in there and we'll give you some money to commission three projects. And so Leading Space went, yep, sounds, sounds interesting and we're interested in engaging with the kind of business community and, you know, corporate environments, um, but it has to have some kind of public aspect to it. <laughs> and so invited me and I thought, oh, it's, it's really interesting. It's quite a challenge of how to make a, an artwork that's kind of as corporate and, and um, you know, consumer culture as it gets, but then trying to engage the local community and, um, yeah the public in some regard and um, I had heard about the Southern Cross Cable during research for earlier projects and had wanted to make a project around it and this was an opportunity to do something in, in Auckland which is where the cable lands and so I kind of proposed something, something along those lines. Um, so the Southern Cross Cable Network is New Zealand's primary internet connection with the rest of the world. It carries roughly 98% of our international internet traffic. Um, it goes out at Takapuna Beach, physically under the sand. It's about this thick. <coughs> Lies along the seabed, all the way up to Hawaii, over to the States where it loops around, comes back through Hawaii, Fiji, Sydney, and then into New Zealand on the other side at Murawai Beach. Um, so, Submarine cables aren't anything particularly new. Some people, you know, think that satellite communication is quite big, but um, you know, light is the fastest thing that we know, and so uh, yeah, it's definitely the most efficient way of communicating that we've got so far. So um, there are many, many um, submarine fibre networks around the world, but New Zealand um, has this one network. So you can kind of see it in the blue in this diagram here, which is from submarine cable map. Dot com, um, which is a frequently updated map of, I guess, publicly known um, submarine cables. Uh, there is a grey line connecting to New Zealand, and that's a proposed cable. That's the Hawaii cable, which hasn't um, actually been laid or yet finalised. Um, and then there's a secondary grey cable from Murawai to Sydney, which is the Tasman Global Connect, which I think maybe laid next year um, and we have the Tasman 2 cable which is primarily telephone so internet so the Southern Cross cable is, is it basically um, so so I kind of carried on researching and I came across this um, article quite quickly uh, where the WikiLeaks um, published a document of 300 sites that the US um, would be quite worried about if they were damaged because it might affect their you know operations and um, the sites that were listed under New Zealand there were sites for New Zealand and the two landing sites of the Southern Cross Cable that was it that was like there's New Zealand there Southern Cross Cable that's that's all we really care about so at this point I kind of started to get a little bit paranoid and there have been these kind of waves of paranoia of surveillance through this project but um, you know in, in Kiwi style I thought well you know let's just let's just kind of get on with it and um, it's all public information anyway. And so 
and so then I started to try and find out where you know the the geographical locations of the landing site for Takapuna because I decided to focus on that that beach in particular um, for JWT and leading space and I found the landing station so the cable lands at Takapuna Beach and it comes inland kind of under the pavement roads basically um, and then comes up and is you know dispersed within um, these landing stations so I did a good little bit of citizen surveillance and found this image. Um, so the, the complex is, is the yellow building and then the building next door and then there's kind of the third building above those and there's a big fence around those and that's, that's it. And so we went to JWT and said, oh, I want to do a project, something to do with the Southern Cross Cable. Um, and they said, cool, that sounds interesting, but um, tell us more. So I went on a site visit up to Auckland in August last year. Um, early morning flight, had this amazing view over Rangitoto and Takapuna, like the Hauraki Gulf, where the cable actually is under the water there somewhere. Um, on the right here is a map from Linz, which is, I think, um, yeah, open access public data of the Hauraki Gulf Cable Protection Area, which is actually a um, legally protected site where boaties can't anchor or fish. So it's, it's kind of an unofficial marine environment, but um, yeah, I don't know that it exactly operates like that, but they kind of started bringing up these interesting narratives of, of maritime culture and, you know, the internet and um, internets and nets and um, uh, piracy and, you know, fishing. There's all these kind of interesting connections with, with maritime language and um, yeah, digital, it's, it's, it's interesting. So. Uh, there was something forming there. Um, and then we visited Takapuna Beach. There's a sign on the beach there warning people of the cable. Um, that's it there. Kind of quite nice, you know. I actually visited the beach um, earlier this year and there was a family sitting kind of right underneath the post making sandcastles. And I thought, you know, it's such a great kind of Kiwi moment of kids digging up potentially our primary <laughs> communication source. Um, <laughs> Only New Zealand. So, and, and then we went inland to see the, um, the landing station. Uh, so, yeah, so this is it. High security. Um, what's really, what really struck me about this was that there, there's no signage at all. Like, it's completely devoid of signage, almost to the point of, um, you know, being conspicuous because of that. So, um, yeah, I found that, I found that quite interesting and, and just kind of took a few photos from the outside and was worried about a security guard coming up, but, but that didn't happen. Um, and, yeah, that was kind of, I took the photos and, and got away. And we went back to Wellington <laughs> um, and... Uh, JWT wanted kind of three more proposals of what the project might be for the cabinet and so I came up with um, three ideas. The first was to do a sort of reading room collating all of this research information I've been finding about the cable um, where people could come and you know like spend time in the cabinet kind of under surveillance of the office staff but then you know having access to this potentially quite um, yeah controversial information. And the second proposal was um, to, uh, to get a couple of snapper fish as office pets um, and, you know, potentially name one John Key and one Kim.com, but, you know, it was a very early stage proposal, <laughs> and have that in this kind of, you know, fish tank glass cabinet thing, um, which, you know, probably wouldn't have worked with the budget. But, um, and the third one was to do some kind of office game with the staff. Uh, where I'd install a fishing dragnet and then um, send images on a kind of weekly basis that would kind of slowly piece together like a jigsaw puzzle to form this image and you know perhaps the office staff could um, take turns at choosing what coordinates they wanted for that week and there would be this kind of exchange and this unveiling project that would you know change over time and hopefully be interesting for the people who work there every day. And so JWT were kind of interested in that in that kind of project, uh, but wanted to know more about what the image might be. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I went away and was like, oh, you know, there's all sorts of things. And then this image came through from um, Nicole Starazowski, who's a, an academic at New York University um, in the kind of media communication area and has been researching the spatial politics of cable landing sites internationally. 
and um, we'd been in conversation about these things and yeah she happened to email me asking if I had a photo of the mural on the inside of the Takapuna cable station which was the first I'd heard of it and I went oh my goodness that could be my image um, and so I emailed Southern Cross Cables uh, to see if I could go and just access the station and then they put me on to Telecom now Spark um, who said oh yes not in the Southern Cross Cable Station in the compact building um, and yeah Mike McGrath the cable manager came back saying there's no longer a mural at the cable station many years ago there was a ceramic mural which was on the entrance wall which is on the same site this mural started to, de to deteriorate and fall apart so it was removed and so you know asked him if he had any documentation and he said you know not sure there's not many people around that would know about this or have photos so I went to archives on, um, in Wellington and searched the mural and found this, this wee image, which was, was about that big, on a kind of A4 of the mural in 1975 installed in the cable station. And I was, just, I was struck by the, by the colours, by the fact that it was an image of Maui fishing up the North Island, which I thought was incredibly kind of relevant in terms of what I'm trying to do. And, JWT, we, we talked about this this um, this story of Maui fishing up the North Island as being a, a potential um, cultural connection for the image. So it was kind of like a, a jackpot moment. Um, so that's the back of the record. I found this newspaper article as well at Archives, um, which is, had a really interesting uh, quote from the artist, E. Mervyn Taylor, who was a Wellington-based artist, um, very amazing, talented man who did a lot of illustrations for the school journals and was, he was kind of part of this um, modernist movement in New Zealand trying to develop a national language kind of beyond our colonial um, heritage and, and the visual arts and it was very interested in Maori culture and um, illustrating that and, and engaging with that as a Pākehā artist and so um, so he said here when asked if he had any special reason for selecting this particular myth for the cable Mr Taylor explained that the myth of fishing up a piece of land was a poetical Polynesian way of describing the discovery of a new island there was an analogy, he thought, between the fishing up of New Zealand by Maui and its modern counterpart where the new cable again draws New Zealand out of the Pacific and into the telephone systems of the world. So it kind of had this really kind of grand feeling to it and, and you know, the similar kind of emotions I was having reactions to the Southern Cross cable. Um, so got back in touch with, with Telecom saying that I'd found an image of the mural and asking where these tiles might be and he went and had a look in the compact station which is now disused and found them uh, in boxes. <laughs> um, so then I went on a site visit, went inside the, com the station this time. Um, this is the, the plaque on the entrance uh, showing John uh, Keith Oli Holyoke opening the compact station in 1962. So the compact cable, there was the Commonwealth Pacific cable, it was a telephone cable that linked Commonwealth countries kind of in the aftermath of World War II. So it linked Australia, New Zealand, Fiji I think was there, um, stopped over in Hawaii, then went Canada, Scotland. And so kind of, kind of this like five eyes network, which is interesting in another way. Um, that's the wall that the mural was on. Uh, the boxes. <laughs> so in various states of repair, there was this weird black cement that, um, yeah, we think might have been roofing cement or something. It was very, that needed a bit of cleaning up. And another really interesting thing that the landing station staff told me was that um, people used to be able to just walk into this foyer off the street. Um, and it was, when it opened in 1962, it was run by the New Zealand post office, which was a government department. Um, and there was a visitor's book that people could sign as they came in. And so they showed me this. It's still in the, in the station and office in an adjacent building. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so it was going on for a while. The entries kind of trail off around 1990. Um, so really selective history of cables. <laughs> So in 1876, New Zealand's first major international submarine telecommunications cable system opened, laid between Sydney and Cable Bay in Nelson. So this was quite a defining moment because before then, you know, 
there's been quite a delay in our communication with the rest of the world. This is an image from, um, from Digital New Zealand. Oh, really? Five minutes. Okay. It's uh, in a set that I've made on Digital New Zealand anyway of people dragging things on beaches. Um, it's compact opened in 1962. Uh, in 1982, the ANSCAN cable was laid as a replacement, so then compact wasn't used. Um, the Lo Labor government got into office in 1984 and split the New Zealand Post Office into three state-owned assets, um, creating Telecom, who took over management of the cable station. Um, and then in 1990, Telecom was privatised and sold off. And so at that point, um, the cable station and the mural had kind of done this full 360 from being a public uh, resource into being completely private. And then there were future cables, and then the Southern Cross cable came along in 1999, and that follows the exact same infrastructure route as Compaq, and it's actually in the building right next door. Um, and so then we had to turn this into, a, into an art project. Um, Telecom were really great and they let us bring the tiles down to Wellington. We had some conservation advice on how to best restore them and then staged a number of working bees to actually clean up the tile. Um, this is Sarah Taylor, E. Mervyn Taylor's granddaughter and the manager of his estate. They've been really supportive of this project, been amazing. And um, then uh, Mervyn Taylor's daughter-in-law there. So we did these working bees, that's my dad and my brother, kind of friends and family, Carrie Ann Lee was there, you know, it was just, it was really great. Kind of lots of record keeping. Um, <laughs> this is the kind of one example of the, the state. We had to clean them up and then taking individual photos in the photography department at Massey have been also very helpful. Um, and then assembling two copies, uh, kind of a quarter size copies of the mural, one on a dragnet in my studio so I could track how it was going and another at the JWT offices. I would post them um, tiles on a kind of weekly basis so they could assemble their own. So the dragnet, um, yeah, it's kind of responding kind of in a subtle way to um, the Edward Snowden debate that was going on at the same time where he talked about dragnet surveillance and I think again tapping into that, that narrative, that kind of maritime narrative. Um, and you know, of course this went on as well, Southern Cross Cable this year. Um, and yeah, I just sort of note that I was using the postal system as a point of kind of testing out other <laughs> communication techniques. That's JWT. And then we also released all the images online under a Creative Commons attribution license. So they're up for download on my website right now. And um, we did four releases, kind of monthly releases. So the image kind of looked like this sometimes. And then that's the final image with 16 missing tiles that were just simply not there. Um, so there's the installation at JWT. Kind of quite an interesting image of the back installed and they're really quite thrilled with it and so where we're at now which maybe you guys can help um, some of the tiles are chipped and need repair so I'm needing to find hold find a conservator who can help clean those up and um, there are 16 missing tiles I need to find a ceramicist who has the skills to make um, replacements uh, there's this painting in the Te Papa collection um, the lovely Megan Tamati now is showing us in this image uh, which is also in need of a bit of restoration which they've said they will do if there's an exhibition so if anyone's interested in talking about an exhibition with these various works um, come and talk to me and uh, I'm working with Spark and a few others to find a permanent installation site for the full mural um, on an ongoing basis and really interested in talking to someone from Takapuna Library which sits on the strand right atop where the cable comes in. Um, and beyond that, uh, I'll be working and in, moving into doing a separate project for the Mural Wire End um, as part of my PhD. So if anyone's got any kind of interesting research tips around that part of the country, um, please talk to me. I'd really like to find a, a Nati Fatua connection who can perhaps, um, you know, has knowledge in this kind of particular area um, of internet culture um, and in issues to, yeah, help talk about some of the land-based connections. Um, I'm going to go to the National Archives in Canberra. They've got a huge collection and then funding stuff um, and maybe scuba diving. So <laughs> that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if we've got time for questions. Have we gone over time? Maybe we have one question if anybody has a burning question for Bronwyn. Yeah, I'll just say as well that... Um, I have with me here today a DVD of footage of the landing, the cable landing on Takapuna Beach in 1999 that the Southern Cross Cable people sent me. So my um, 
see about playing some of that in the break, but it's probably not time here so now. Quick question for Roman, or yeah, she'll be here obviously at afternoon tea as well. So maybe if we just move to our next session. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.